I am unable to uh, hear you. You are muted. You are muted. Yes, sir. Now I have unmuted myself. Sir, you want to share your screen, sir? Yeah, I don't know what is your uh, program. I, I have a presentation. I can share that. Yeah. So you please uh, share the screen because I have just. Uh, okay. So we are here to just hear you only, sir. So uh, we'll be hearing you only. So you just share the screen, sir, so that we can then go ahead within 55 minutes. All right. Uh, tell me whether I am audible. Yes, yeah, sir. You are perfectly audible. OK. I am trying to switch this head headphone. And uh, that is where it is. And I'm trying to switch this on. Let yeah. me. Let me share the screen with you. Um, you have to enable sharing because it uh, has di disabled. Oh, administrator, sharing. please uh, enable uh, Dr. Pradeep screen. Uh, yes, now it has come. Now it has come. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Now we can see. All right. Yes, yeah, sir. We can see the screen. Perfect. Perfect. Very nice. Yes. Uh, okay, uh, Doctor Devedi, can can I connect to you? Uh, Doctor Devedi, are you there? Professor Devedi, are you there? Yeah. Sir, please unmute yourself. Yes, sir, I can just see you. Yes, madam. Yes, so sir, we'll be starting within, uh, I think, three minutes. Okay. Ready, sir? We'll be starting within three right, minutes. Right, right. OK, thank you, sir. OK, madam, thank you. Just wait for the three minutes. OK, thank you, sir. Madam, the screen is uh, good. In, uh, yeah. you know, it's appearing good. Okay. Very good, sir. It's very good, sir. It's outstanding, I can say that. And even your voice and reception is also very good. Sometimes it happens that uh, there there are certain differences, but with the base of my go today, is also clear here, so we can see everything. All right. Maybe while the lecture is going on, we can all uh, probably video can be switched off and then the bandwidth will be better. Yeah, yes, yeah, so it will be. That we will be doing. Uh, rather, participants, we have requested them to just switch off their videos and uh, we'll just switch off other videos too. Okay, okay participants, as uh, you have just, uh, Sir is also saying, uh, if any one of you have uh, switched on your videos, please uh, switch off your videos and Keep your audio on mute mode so that we can have uh, the best learning experience which we could have. So please uh, do that. Please switch off your videos and mute your audios. We are just going to start. So with your permission, Devedi sir, I am starting. With the permission yes, of the principal of the yes. college, I am yes. starting. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, so uh, welcome. Uh, first, of all, first of all, I welcome uh, Dr. T. Pradeep uh, from uh, IIT uh, Madras, Chennai. First of all, I welcome you, sir, on this virtual platform. We very much want, and we would always want that you uh, visit this college also whenever the situation permits so. But now at this time, at this point of this pandemic time, I welcome you on the virtual platform. None of us, uh, uh, are uh, we have uh, i think we i can say that we have read about a lot uh, i just uh, read an article in times of india about you so basically we know a lot about you uh, so it's a great experience to just see you on this virtual platform so very welcome sir i welcome all the participants of this uh, talk which is today and i welcome a principal of the college 
Dr. H. S. Devedi and uh, depart head of the Department of Chemistry, Dr. Rajesh Pare, is also with us. I welcome you, sir, all the faculty, all the colleagues, and students who are joining with us. I welcome you all. These students are joining across uh, India who are the chemistry practitioners or who are into serious chemistry. They are joining us. So I welcome you all on this platform. Today is the first international year which is declared by a resolution of UN as the first international day for international day for clean air for a clean air for blue skies this is the first international day which uh, we are celebrating and this has been adopted by a UN resolution so i welcome sir on this uh, talk on this auspicious day but before i request dr devedi to welcome him i just read a small uh, however i i said that we all know dr pradeep a lot but even then i i am just reading a few lines about him dr t pradeep is an institute professor at the indian institute of technology madras chennai india he is the deepak parekh institute chair professor and is also a professor of chemistry he studied at the university of calicut indian institute of science us uc berkeley and purdue his research interests are in molecular and nano scale materials and he develops instrumentation for such studies he is an author of over 478 scientific papers in journals and is an inventor of 120 patents or patent applications in addition to the work on advanced materials he is involved in the development of affordable technologies for drinking water purification and some of them have been commercialized too i think sir you are the inventor for amrit cool that i have uh, read in many articles his pesticide removal technology is estimated to have reached about 9 million people along with his associates he has incubated five companies and three of them have production units his arsenic removal technology approved for national implementation is delivering arsenic free water to about 1 million people every day he is a recipient of several awards including the great shanti swarup bhatnagar prize bm Bar uh, birla science prize national award for award for nano science and nano technology india nanotech innovation award and jc bose national fellowship he is the winner of the world academy of sciences prize in chemistry for the year 2018 the nation conferred padma shri on him in 2020 we congratulate you sir he is also the recipient of nikkei asia prize 2020 he is a fellow of indian national science academy indian academy of sciences national academy of sciences india indian national academy of engineering royal society of chemistry the world academy of sciences and american association for the advancement of science he is a distinguished professor in a few institutions uh, and he is visiting a few institutions in india and also on the graduate faculty of purdue university he is the author of introductory textbook nano the essentials by magro hill and is one of the authors of the monograph nano fluids which is really into science and an advanced textbook a textbook of nano science and nano technology by Mac, again by magro hill he is on the editorial board of journals such as acs uh, nano chemistry of materials analytical chemistry chemistry and asian general nano scale nano scale horizons particle science reports international journal of water and waste water treatment etc and is an associate editor of acs sustainable chemistry and engineering he has authored popular science books in malayalam original language uh, we all know of india and is the recipient of kerala sahitya academy award for knowledge literature in 2015 he received the lifetime achievement research award of iit madras as part of his philanthropic activities he supports a school in his village where 500 students are on the rolls such is a distinguished speaker which we are having today i just want to add a note to it that professor uh, pradeep is institute professor and institute professor is the highest title a professor can earn in an institute or university professor pradeep is the second faculty member to earn this title at iit madras 
among a faculty of 600 congratulations sir and now i invite dr harishankar divedi uh, principal of the college to please come forward and welcome such a distinguished guest uh, dr divedi please sir can you listen me dr divedi divedi sir are you there sir divedi sir can you listen me can you hear me sorry is uh, video is frozen ha ah, yeah uh administrator please look into that yeah sir sir please unmute your video uh, unmute your audio sir uh thank you madam am yeah, i audible sir. yeah yeah sir you are audible sir please uh thank you dr singh and on this first international day of clean air and blue sky for blue skies and clean water the particular day aims to raise public interest and awareness at all levels be it individual community corporate or government that clean air and water are important for health economy and environment given the current backdrop with the wide scale transmission of covid-19 the day assumes as even more important role in propagating the urgent need to address air and water pollution and challenges it poses moving towards more sustainable ecosystem in the same context today we have an eminent personality amongst us padmashri dr pradeep his wide work is uh, on the topic in india and as well as abroad therefore i welcome this personality and rather the international personality and whole of the college team and participant to avail the opportunity in its whole some mean so uh, i welcome you all thank you and dr uh, pradeep i welcome you thanks thanks a lot thank Over you to dr. dr okay thank you uh, dr devedi and now i would just uh, request dr pradeep the floor is all yours sir i would request participants to please again if some of you uh, have not done that please switch off your videos and turn your audio on mute mode and just experience uh, the flow which uh, dr pradeep is going to give us floor is all yours sir welcome sir thank you thank you a very good morning to all of you my greetings to you on the international day of clean air for blue skies what a wonderful title uh, it is a pleasure uh, to speak to you on this platform and this became possible because of uh, uh, you know this energetic lady who went on demanding that uh, that i address you on this occasion thank you dr kalpana singh i have not been to your college but i have been to jain uh, and uh, this great city and have been to your your state uh, madhya pradesh in different parts of the state and there are i have several students from from that state and it is a very dear place for me it is madhya it is center of uh, all activities for the country in many ways on this day when dr kalpana singh asked me what would i speak to you i chose this title chemistry for clean air blue skies and clean water in a way it is giving back to our society because many people accuse today chemistry for making the air dirty the sky dirty the water dirty 
chemistry is both the villain and the savior. And therefore it is important to address this issue through chemistry and for you, it is not just an opportunity for academic learning. It is also a realization that you can have your future through this. And I will not be in the time that is available. I will not be able to touch upon everything, but I will only give you some pointers uh, in this direction. And those of you who wish to pursue this further, I would like you to explore and research opportunities or pointers that are thrown uh, along these slides. Also in touch with me in case you are interested in. If I were to address this problem in a, a grand scale, I see what all of us should realize that Earth is the only home that we have. This picture is celebrated as the most important environmental picture ever taken in the history of mankind. This picture is called the Earthrise. Earthrise is a picture that was taken on December 24, 1968 from the Apollo space station by astronaut William Andrews. And this picture talks a whole lot about our planet. Look at this, where someone is taking a picture with moon in the background, and you are looking at, the, looking at our mother earth at a distance, and you see that it appears as a blue dot. It is a blue dot because it is water. And as all of you know, Earth is mostly water. But what is important is to realize is that if you look at it from space, this is the only planet, only object that appears blue with life. And for many people, this has, well, this particular picture has given a lot of imagination, a lot of ideas to understand what is Earth. In the words of Carl Sagan, this profound speaker, person who took science to masses through his great book, Cosmos. If you are interested in, please read this book. Sagan said, that, look at this, look, at, uh, look again at that dot. That's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being, whoever was, lived out their lives. They're all on this planet, on this blue dot. If I were to paraphrase Sagan, I would say, all your love and hate is confined to this dot. It is all that we have. It is important to protect it. And therefore, this particular day, celebrating the day for blue skies is an important event in the history of mankind. And for that, one has to do a lot. And there are so many other pictures of this kind, but I would like you to ponder over this thought that all that you have is confined to this dot. If our community the world over, if there is a realization that this dot is all that place that you have, then the world will be completely different. And the science, the technology, the business that we practice, if it were to be 
with that realization, the world will be a great place. And that is the world wherein, if I were to quote somebody else, uh, I, I would say that the chemistry of that world will become poetry. The chemistry of that world will become poetry. Can we practice that chemistry? Well, that's a long question, and there are a lot many ingredients in this. Many people call that chemistry a sustainable chemistry. Many people call it as green chemistry. You may call that various ingredients of that chemistry as atom economy and many other things. Uh, let me move on. Why is that chemistry not with us? Why is it that chemistry is not poetry now? Look at this. This is what is prevalent in Indian villages. Uh, Wikipedia says that there are 100 million households in India using chulas at least three times a day. And that, of course, produces so much of smoke, uh, so much of carbon monoxide, so many other uh, toxins, and uh, so many carcinogens. And uh, villages are full of this. And not just villages, everywhere is full of this. So you may say that the problem is combustion. We don't know how to burn fuels well. We don't know how to burn fuels well efficiently with limited setting. And that, of course, goes further, not just to this, but also to automobiles. That also goes to power generation and many others. So it is that. Probably we don't know combustion well enough. Well, is this the only thing? But you see, not just this domestic problem, there is this huge problem that we have created. Uh, in between this and the previous slide, there are a huge number of technologies. But you may say, that what you see is the smoke of a, a hydrogen bomb exploded in 1952 at a test site. You might say that the problem is chemistry, problem is physics, problem is technology. All of them together made what it is, what you see. Well, this is not the only thing. And from Madhya Pradesh, I don't have to remind you of this problem of Bhopal is, is, uh, is sort of shocking you and shocking me even after so many years. And problems still continue. And Bhopal is not one example. There are many Bhopals of many different kinds of Minamatas and many others. Environmental disasters are not something that of Somewhere else, environmental disasters are right here. And, and, and we are facing them as a country almost every day. Every monsoon faces environmental disasters due to global warming today. Now, having looked at all of these, when you look at the world in larger scale, you realize that we have reached this problem or the scale of this problem just very short time. Look at the scale wherein we are plotting the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide. And the x-axis is time. You see that for over 8 million years, we have data. Well, this data are extrapolated. Uh, now you, you see that historical data is essentially constant. But just in the past 200 years, we have made a big change. And today, CO2 levels are at something like 404 to 410 parts per million. 
And that is where we are today. And this is where we are supposed to be in 2100. And if we do not control our emissions, we could even be here. What does this mean? Well, if you want to really know what that will take you to, you have to simply look at the sky and look at Venus. So this is the planet Venus. And planet Venus atmospheric temperature is 467 degrees centigrade. And one wonders what is this huge temperature about? This huge temperature is just because of this high pressure atmosphere, 93 bar atmosphere, which is mostly carbon dioxide, or it is an atmosphere which can capture infrared. And that makes the temperature so high. And this is to say, what is the effect of global warming? And if gases can warm up and capture carbon dioxide or methane or ammonia or water vapor or whatever, then the temperatures can be so high and there will not be anyone left. And this can all happen in such a short time. Imagine what have we done? We have homo sapiens, you know that we have a reasonable history of something like maybe about 120,000 years or so. And in that, when India, very, very recent book of, uh, of, of uh, Indians say that Indian habitations are somewhere around 65,000 years old. That is so short, but all this long period we haven't changed the planet, but in just the past 200 years, we have changed it so abruptly that it has become irreversible. The story, it can be illustrated, well, through water, it can be illustrated through carbon dioxide, it can be illustrated through many other atmospheric contaminants or through contaminants in the rivers and ocean and all that. But I work in the area of water. Therefore, I chose this example of water to tell you water is coming to our us through rain. And rain has been essentially constant. And for Chennai, it has been somewhere in this regime for all these years, ever since we had uh, rain date. In the past few years, it has actually increased. And this is the story of Chennai some hundred years ago, but about 90 years ago or so. The real reason why Chennai or any such city is facing a huge crisis in the context of water is largely because of population. So we are today somewhere in the range of 4.8 or 5, let us say, about 5 million people. And this has happened in just such a short time. This is, this may be said about any city in the country. Here is water or water uh, bodies in Chennai. And this data was compiled by my friend and colleague, Professor Ilango. So from 1893, when water bodies were like this, 1909, water bodies essentially the constant. 1950, water bodies were essentially almost the same. 54, we still have some data. Now, 73, you see that many of those lakes have disappeared. 91, some more disappeared. And uh, 2000, this is what it is. And now you see a little later, 2006 and 2013 and 2017, this is what we have. 
So in every city, we have completely removed all the water catchment, all the large water bodies, all that nature can conserve, preserve, we have, we have simply removed them in the process of development. Well, this is not about Chennai, this is about Bangalore, this is about any other city. We have also explored it in population. Now, where will water be for all this planet? Now, in today's world, it is not just water that is of interest. Some years ago, we used to say that water, we have to make it clean to ensure that pandemics are not there. You might remember the cholera epidemic. And it comes through water. But today, the pandemics are coming through air. And it is not the Spanish flu or pandemics of the past, pandemics of present are also coming to air. Now, obviously you need to find new solutions. Let me go back and take you to my own interest in water and why am I pursuing this? For me, for a villager in Kerala, these are very common things. And in my own neighborhood, this is not my pond, but my own neighborhood, this is common, even today. As you can see several steps, and this water can be seen right to the very bottom. And this is the kind of ponds we used to take bath in. Just about 50, 60, 15, 16 kilometers away from my own place is this, this mighty river, the longest river of uh, Kerala. It is called this Bharadapura, 264 kilometers long river. And in my place, it is completely dry. This is just after monsoon, one, about two weeks after monsoon. This is not just about one river. Every river in the country is having this story. Water is completely gone. Although waterfall has been, rainfall has been essentially constant, water is not there. This is what development has done and we will not have time to discuss all of those great details, uh, but it is important to realize Looking at water, water itself is a cycle. For a chemist, uh, water plus carbon dioxide is what makes this planet what it is. Water plus co carbon dioxide and add some sunlight to it in presence of this great molecule, chlorophyll, uh, you have sugar and oxygen. And sugar and oxygen, if you burn, all of us burn, and then you take this back to carbon dioxide and water in the process we live. So the cycle that keeps our planet is just the cycle. It's not that, and of course, as chemistry goes, this whole thing is atom economy is 100%. So all the molecules here or all the atoms here, you can find them here. Therefore, nature, has been living like this for a very, very long time, not with much of changes uh, in water or in carbon dioxide or in oxygen. But then we came in and we of course, not only converted this sugar and oxygen to water and carbon dioxide for our biological processes, we also changed these for our industrial processes. So in that process, we use sugar, not only sugar, whatever sugar can make, whatever carbonaceous materials can make into petroleum. We made all these and then converted them faster and faster with faster kinetics. We, for our living, for not only for us and all the animals and all that, we require, we, will, we would have produced just about 29 billion tons of CO2 per year. But 
because of our industrial processes, we are making 258 billion tons of CO2. About 10 times more CO2 is what we produce because of our actions. It is not just sugar. Of course, nature produces many other things like alkaloids and terpenes and nitrogenous compounds and many others. All of them we burn as well. And we produce more and more of these and uh, we produce acid rain. So if you start looking at this, this giant wheel, you see that we have completely opened up the sustainable cycle. And the problem is that opening up. Many people ask me, is there a solution that nanotechnology can offer in the context of clean water? So we wrote about this, and if you are interested in, please look at this in 2020, just about a month ago, this came out. There are many, many solutions. But water is such a simple molecule. Uh, this simple molecule is so complex. And this complexity is what you see. And sometimes you wonder, how can a triatomic molecule contain so much of complexity within? And we still don't know uh, that the reasons for this complexity, all these dynamics that you just now discussed, you, know, you just now saw, and all that is arising from water's inherent structure. Similarly, we also should understand the complexity of the periodic table to understand why we are having clean water. In fact, I say that water is in water, or the story of water is incomplete without this table. See, on this planet, we have so many of these molecules, so many of these elements. And on the surface of this planet, we have just a few elements and all the other elements are either not there or they have gone to the sea or they are in very stable forms. If you take this molecule, atoms like or elements like aluminum and silicon, oxygen and all, they all exist on the surface in the form of oxides. And because they exist in the form of these minerals, our water is clean because these minerals cannot dissolve in, in water. All those which can dissolve in water, they have dissolved and they have disappeared into the ocean. So water is free, water is clean on this planet because of the periodic table and its complexity and its chemistry. We have to use, when water is dirty, we have to use this very same elements to get water clean back again. That's because if I were to use some other elements, they might get into water and make it dirty again. So creating clean water uh, from dirty water essentially uses the elements that I have circled here and their, comp their various combinations. Sometimes you wonder, is it possible really to create this kind of uh, sustainable technology just with a few elements. I might remind you that nature, this complex machine is built with just a few elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, some amount of phosphorus and sulfur, and a few other elements. Just with a few elements, we have created so, so much of complexity. So obviously, it is possible to create clean water with just a few elements. So what did I do so that I can illustrate to you what more you can do? Uh, to tell you that, I need to take you through uh, some Indian realities. There are these many people suffering in India due to arsenic. Remember that this problem was detected over 106 years ago. We knew the solutions for this. We did not make them affordable. As a result, although we knew this problem so long, well, this problem existed for so long, we still continue to have this and 80 million people suffer due to this. This problem of fluoride was first detected in India in 1937. 
even after that, so many years after that, we have 130 million suffering due to fluoride. India is full of all of these in many, many parts of the country. And we suffer due to that. We suffer due to conditions of chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology. This is a new kind of thing found in many parts of the world, especially in Latin American countries and recently in Sri Lanka. This has come to India. Endocrine disrupting chemicals are plenty and almost every day we are detecting them. None of our Indian rivers are free of endocrine disrupting chemicals. So look at this complex problem. You see that water is extremely toxic and a lot many things have to be done there. This more can be done if you understand what these implications are. So look at a WHO statement. Long-term exposure to arsenic from drinking water and food can cause cancer and skin lesions. It has also been associated with developmental effects, cardiovascular disease, neurotoxicity, and diabetes. If you know this, if our country, we are subjecting 80 million people to all of these, where is democracy? How can we ensure that everyone has equal opportunities? Everyone has liberty. So the fundamental principles of democracy are sort of staring at us if we subject our people to this. So there are many people who have worked on such problems and nanotechnology for clean water is therefore a very interesting subject area for many people. And it has new adsorbents it has new sensors, it has new catalysts, it has new phenomena. Obviously, all of them lead to new devices. We work on all of these. So therefore, it will be difficult to cover all of them. And all of them are not only related to water, but also related to air. I've written something on this the subject area, about 500 page, a book, uh, which we call Aqua Nanotech. I must also tell you, nanomaterials today are not materials that you make as a powder and put it in the transmission electron micrograph or microscope and measure some images. Today, such particles have become so precise in their composition, something like you say 25 atoms of gold with 18 ligands connected to this, with one minus charge. So this entity is, is this. This has a precise molecular structure, meaning it can be crystallized. So nanomaterials today are not materials that have some spherical shape. Of course they are spherical or whatever shape, but they can be precise like this. And when you say they are precise, their composition can be measured with a mass spectrum. So today, techniques have advanced. So when you say techniques have advanced, it is also possible that we can study their properties with great precision. So this mass spectrum, if I expand, I get all of these, and these peaks are due to the isotopic distribution of elements present. I have no time to discuss all of these, but remember that nanomaterials are not something that you can only observe in a transmission electron microscope, but you can today measure their molecular properties. So when you have such materials, not the previous uh, materials of the previous slide, but in general, a lot of such materials, what is that we can do? Many people said that you can use it for well, advanced catalysts. You can use it uh, for tomorrow's electronics. You can use it uh, for memory storage. Uh, 
uh, or health and drug delivery. So many of these are important and many of my friends work in these areas. I chose to work on something very mundane. Think about this. Here is a, uh, a boy pumping water from a bore well, and this is a very common site in Indian villages. You must be having them near Ujjain. So here is a, a cement platform. On the cemented bench or platform, this well is sitting, or this pump is sitting, it is about 40 years old. So this is a cast iron pump, and you are drawing water from a depth of something like 80 feet or so. On this cement platform, you see these are red patches. And this place is Nadia district in West Bengal. And in this particular region, when iron is present, there can be arsenic present as well. And this boy is pumping arsenic containing water, which is about 60 to 100 micrograms per liter or parts per billion of arsenic in this water. Now you ask the question, what is this nanomaterial can do? So we made some nanomaterials and packed it in here. And there are several other nanomaterials here. When this boy pumps, one stroke of this pump produces about 300 ml of water. In about two seconds, this water gets cleaned up and what you see is clean water, which has less than two parts per billion arsenic. The limit is 10 parts per billion. Now this happens with no additional pressure drop, no additional work by this boy. It happens with no additional contact time, no delay, and about thousand liters of water can be produced by this device every day. And this works for one and a half years nonstop in the field. And after that, you have to change the filter medium. Now, this is one such small thing, but of course there are, this can be done not at 100 liters per day scale. This can be done today at a million liters per day scale. So we do that, not just this scale, but at any other scale. So therefore it is now possible to deliver nanotechnology for clean water. So is that the only thing? No, there are many others that you can do. The material that I showed you uh, in that mass spectrum, that kind of material emits red light when you irradiate it with ultraviolet. Such materials can be incorporated into membranes. In visible light, they look like this. In ultraviolet light, they look like this. And these, these colors that you see, they are because of these clusters that I showed you. These clusters react with metal ions. And this is the cluster solution, which is red in color in under ultraviolet light. And this is the membrane I told you about. And this is made of polymers. And these polymers are spun to form tiny fibers like these, which you can't see with naked eye, but they are under a microscope. Now, what happens is that when mercury ions pass through this, it changes the color because it reacts with these clusters. And what you see is a change in that color. The color completely disappears. Of course, you can make this disappear or color appear depending upon the kind of technology you do. But what is important is that the membrane is now functional. And the membrane is like a pH meter. It is telling you about the contaminants present in water or the filter is telling you about the contaminant present in water. So I showed you just two examples of that. But what is that in a broader scale? You can create nanomaterials of many kinds. So this is a very, very, very important journal called Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. We wrote this paper several years ago, seven years ago. What we showed was that we can create composite nanomaterials and pass dirty water, but then this material cleans up water. 
and it removes all bacteria and viruses and such things. So in general, water has about 92 species regulated. 21 species regulated uh, are, are uh, here allogenated organics. 15 species regulated are metals. 13 species regulated are organochlorine pesticides, etc. If you count all of them, there are very many species. There are many others being considered uh, to be included in this contaminant list called candidate contaminants. So that is a complex recipe, but all of them can be controlled with nanoparticles. So long, long ago, we showed that nanoparticles can degrade pesticides. So that resulted in my first patent and that became a product and uh, started selling. So in this paper, we showed that nanoparticles of a particular kind can be made to clean water. So when you start well, looking into this area, we obviously ask this question, there are plenty of other materials. What is so new about this? Well, if you take many of the materials already used for water purification, such as ion exchange resins, they are made in water. And in the process of making them, you dirty water. Of course, you, the material itself cleans water, but after its life cycle, it goes back to nature and it contaminates water again. So if you ask this question, is that, what is the net water produced? You often find that it is negative. So my question was, is it possible to produce water positive materials? You spend a liter of water, for its production, but you make 1,000 liters of clean water in, during its life cycle and it doesn't contaminate water. Can we create such materials which are water positive? Is it possible that such synthesis is done in water medium, but it doesn't require organic solvents and it doesn't pollute the environment? Can it be done at room temperature without grid power, uh, can you ultimately make such materials made at room temperature and water, water stable? This is like saying that you are making seashells which are made at room temperature and in water, but they are extremely stable in water. And seashells are stable for hundreds and thousands of years. And you know, there are many mummified things that you might have heard about. So they exist. If you are in a position to do that, then obviously we are talking about a green material. So what we do, our nanomaterials are synthesized using biopolymers. So these are some biological polymers in this particular case, chitosan. And uh, you gradually precipitate tiny nano sheets on these and these nano sheets are aluminum oxyhydroxide and if you look at this transmission electron microscope in microscopic image in greater detail, you see some tiny sheets like these. Because it's a two dimensional image, it doesn't tell you about the three dimensional idea about it. So this is a cartoon to tell you what it is like. So we have these biopolymers and these are tiny nano sheets of 50 nanometers long and 15 nanometers wide and about 50 nanometers in depth. So these are like sheets like that. And several sheets can be packed together and you can also pack the sheets this way and you can pack the sheets this way. So you create matchboxes. So in such matchboxes, you can put nanoparticles and such nanoparticles put here is silver nanoparticles and you can see them. To begin with, they were all in water soluble, but they became water insoluble. And you can see that this is like sand and over which water is standing and several years water will stand like this. So these are like seashells I told you. So what is so great about it? And uh, everybody knows that silver releases silver ions and kills bacteria. But the great thing about it is that normal silver, it kills bacteria of course, but then it works only for the first week because on that silver, there will be a tiny layer of contaminants deposited from real water. I'm not talking about drinking water. 
well, distilled water, in river water or any tap water, there are contaminants which sit on the silt. So as a result, silver ion release in water will come down with time. But here you see silver ion release is nearly constant at 50 parts per billion. And we test this not with 100 ml of water, we test this with 1,500 liters of water. Now what does this do? At this concentration, you can destroy bacteria. And this is the limit of silver, so this is safe. Now, how do you say that it is uh, destroying bacteria? This is live bacteria. This is dead bacteria. You can do this kind of imaging. Can the silver particles get into water and in organisms? These are E. coli. And you can deliberately put silver particles into these E. coli. And you can do spectroscopy within this particle or of these particles taken up by E. coli. And this is deliberate. But in your material, silver ions alone are released, not silver particles. And you can see these bacteria, they are lysed, meaning their bacterial membrane is broken, but there are no nanoparticles. So they are killed because of the effect of silver ions, not because of the silver nanoparticles. So there is no nanotoxicity associated with it. We can have bacteria passing through such a filter that we can make such a filter. And then you find that uh, the bacterial concentration comes down. And you see, you can also do this experiment with lead. You can do this with arsenic or many others. This is not the end of uh, you know, such materials. There are many, many different types of materials that we can make. And one such material is here in greater detail, and these are tiny particles of iron oxyhydroxide. These are very common materials present in the field, but these common materials present in the field are, cannot be made stable in this nanoscale form. And we make them stable, and what is so great about that? When such materials are stable, with about 30 grams of this material, you can clean up arsenic something like 1,000 liters of arsenic containing water can be cleaned up. So here is that filter. And this is arsenic concentration, 200 parts per billion of arsenic, 3 plus and 5 plus combined, 100 plus 100. And then you pass it through this filter, and this is what happens. And till about 1,100 liters, it is reasonably safe. And beyond that, of course, materials capacity decreases. You can also do this for iron removal. So you can remove both of these and you can test this for a domestic purifier, not just passing that many liters, you can pass 6,000 liters. Arsenic is removed. How does it work? You of course can study spectroscopy. So here is a model system. Well, this is a model of that material and here is a particular ion called arsenite, arsenate, iron, uh, arsenic 5 plus. And this is an ion, ion called arsenite. And they have different Raman stretching frequencies, Raman frequencies. And using these, you can understand how, uh, what kind of binding is happening on the surface and what is the reason for this removal. You can model this. So here is a nanoparticle of this iron oxyhydroxide and you can find out how this uh, binding happens. Having known such a thing, you can implement it in the field. So this is something that is already present in the field, about 40 cents of land and about several of these lumina containers. Water is passed through this and you produce a uh, 20 meter cube of water. 20 meter cube is 20 into 1,000 uh, liters of water per hour. So 10 hours you work, you make uh, 200,000 liters of water. But this is all over 40 cents of land, I told you. Now this particular thing serves water to about 2,500 people. You can implement this entire thing using such a material, I told you in previous case, in just about 5 cents of and in such a reduced filtration volume. And this is 
highly important for highly populous country like India. And working exactly at the same kind of uh, capacities, 20 meter cube there, it is 18 meter cube here. And that is the input concentration, that is the output concentration. It works, it's not just working for one day or 10 days. It has been working for four and a half years now. So we have now implemented across in different parts of the country. And this is in Punjab. And this is not just one unit. Uh, and you not only do this at, uh, at that kind of scale, but also do this uh, in commercially viable scale. So this particular scale is now per liter of water, this is the money that you spend for a clean water. And you implement this uh, with community participation. You implement it, uh, the previous one I told you in several schools across the country. And you monitor this, many people monitor the water quality uh, of, of the such devices. You put this in village units in Punjab now, this is in Amritsar district, several, several such units. And you do this at kind of scales like these, and uh, that kind of units are supplying now 10 million liters of water a day. So obviously, plenty of questions come up about water quality that you face in the field. Every day, water is changing. What do you do with the spent media? How do you ensure that there is no toxicity? And how do you manage the sludge? How do you reactivate it? How do you make it cost effective? Uh, various weather conditions and rainy seasons and winter and all that. How do you live with this? All of these we have worked on. But nanomaterials of this kind, this is not the only thing, uh, only technology that one can do. This is another technology called capacitive deionization, which is uh, having two electrodes and one electrode is positively charged, another electrode is negatively charged and water is containing salts is passed through by electro absorption, you can remove salts and you can have a um, unit. And this is now a factory and this is now selling units across uh, the coast of India where you get a lot of sunlight and this entire technology can be made run on solar and, uh, and it can produce water and water ATMs of this kind are now implemented. So while such technologies are there, it is also important to measure their concentration. So we do measurements with uh, mobile phones, just like a diabetes meter. And we have sensors of this kind. And that is, this is not yet a technology or a product now, but it is soon going to come out. So what does this mean? This means that water purifiers along with water sensors can make a water economy and the entire uh, water quality can, can be monitored nationally with big data and it is possible to understand the health of the population. There are many other materials, uh, nanostructured materials for water harvesting, for example. Uh, I do not have time to tell you this in great detail, but here is a nanostructured material made of metals. These are looking like uh, grass. So if I were to look at the surfaces look like these thorns of uh, cacti. And they cool when this temperature of ambient temperature cools down, humidity condenses on this. And this can be used to collect water similar to insects collecting water. And we have now a company which is called Vayu Gel Technologies. So air is brought to the surface, condensing on such nanostructured surfaces, and you get water. But that water is without salt. You need to add salt to it, and for which new kinds of minerals, it's very similar to the minerals that you have on the Gangetic Plateau, you can make such things. There are many others globally working on several nanostructured materials absorbing humidity. We also have nano sheets, which can be selectively drilled to make holes and using such holes, we can clean water. I will not bother you with this great details about this particular slide. I'll skip this particular thing to say that there are very many technologies and very many of them have been implemented to products. I showed you this one, this one, and this is at most breakwater harvesting. Globally, there are many others. 
There are 2D sheets like these, and friends of mine work on this. These are graphene. And you can create sheets like these, and such sheets can be engineered to filter water. And in fact, you can create functionalities by applying electrical potential. You can stop the flow or make the flow. And it is possible to create that. And in the next slide, you will see uh, that friends are making other kinds of sub materials. I hope this is going. Uh, so these are, friends are making uh, materials which can capture oil from water. So these are oil spills, as you know, are very you know, important problems. And in this particular case, what is shown is that one kind of material can capture, uh, here you will see that. Here is somebody capturing that entire oil is captured through new materials. Uh, whereas conventional materials in this, you see, it is not capturing. So that is, such materials can be used to harvest uh, fog, for example. This is not only that can be done. We have shown that there are other forms of water, such as water cages. These are called clathrates, hydrates. Clathrates are cages of water in which molecules can be confined. And such cages, um, well, this is methane cage. Methane has been captured in water in the form of some ice. Good thing is that this is produced or this is there in plenty in oceans or under the ocean. Methane is produced by biodegradation and methane atmospheric, uh, te when temperature goes down under the ocean bed at high pressures, you can create ice in which this methane is trapped. And people are trying to recover that hydrate to extract energy. But good thing is that when you take out that material, this is nothing but clean, well, water. There is no salt in it. And so if you take out methane from that, you will get fuel, but the leftover water is nothing but clean water. So you can get both methane and portable water from this process. So there are several other technologies. Atmosphere contains CO2. And is it possible CO2 to methanol, can it be, can it be done by atmospheric, uh, well, well in, in processes using sunlight? And this is indeed possible. But all of these, although there are technological solutions, looking at India, there are plenty of complex problems. India has many events of this kind. Everything throws so much of dirt into ocean or, or rivers. It is our cultural uh, history. How do you ensure that rivers are clean? Water is clean. India produces this much of this many million liters of uh, sewage, but only this much is treated, just about 30%. Balance is going untreated. So how do you recover water? I told you about the story of uh, drinking water, which is just about 10% of the total water. About 70% of the total water is going for, for agriculture and 20% is going for industry. But Indian agriculture is one that is so much unsustainable because 67% of Indian agriculture is run on groundwater, meaning water which is not replenished from using bore wells and such things. So there is a complex issue around that. It is not only water issue, it is a politics issue, it is an energy issue, it's a technology issue. But you see that solutions are indeed there. But these solutions have to be translated to technologies and they need to be delivered to people. And if such technologies have to be taken to clean air, sustainable agriculture and food Obviously, India will be a different place. Now, 
what are those technologies? Is it possible to take the clean air, remove all this dirt from it? It is indeed possible. You know, dirt or dust is a very complex thing. We know today that dust from Sahara Desert can go all the way, travel all the way, 2,400 kilometers and end up in the Atlantic Ocean. How is it possible that dust from Sahara goes to Atlantic? It is because dust is very complex. Now, that complex chemistry, if you understand, is it not possible to capture dust? Yes, it is possible. I will not have time to tell you all of these. Now, solutions for many of these, as you can see, IC engines are producing, internal combustion engines are producing a lot of carbon dioxide and water vapor. Can this water vapor be converted to liquid water? Can that be clean? Is this water, when you come back home, is, can this water be used to irrigate, to have agriculture on your windowsills? Can you have plants from this? Can CO2 make CO2 methanol? Can you recycle water at, at home affordably? Can you have new desalination methodologies so that power utilization is less and energy utilization, energy utilization is less and reject is less? Can we make products wherein water consumption is less? Can we have a water audit associated with every consumer product? Can we have a national policy on, on those so that we use better detergents? Can we have nanotech enabled water infrastructure so that water is monitored? Can we have sensors on a water bottle? This can change the country and the world. Can clean air, clean environment, biodiversity related water technologies be developed? Can nanotech be there for water conservation? New sources of water, can they be found by harvesting water from air, recycling and auditing? Can we put water in our planning? So when you say sustainable clean water or sustainable clean air or sustainable whatever, we have a lot of conflicting issues. We have this development, which the way that we understand is consume more. We consume more power, you say we are developed. Consume more water, we say we are developed. We have this human aspiration to grow a better lifestyle and whatever, whatever. And we are increasing our population. All of these are causing tremendous burden on the the amount of water, as I told you, it's a closed cycle. It's limited. Therefore, from going from this, using limited resources to a developed society, of course, is a challenge. It puts limits to growth. You cannot consume all the water in the planet. All the water in the planet is not enough for one person because the greed is so much. You may have a number of technologies. You may have a number of solutions. But ultimately, we need to have limits to growth. We need to know where our world should lead to. So I started out by saying, looking at the ocean, looking at the world from above, but actually this world is within us, right in our hand. Today, with our technologies and connectivity, we can see what is happening to the world by our actions. We can do sustainable agriculture or sustainable disinfection or smart living or self-contained homes or look at clean water or clean air or whatever. You can see the impact what we do on our planet. So for that, to find better solutions, we are today living in a digital ecosystem where everything is connected. And our technologies that we talk about can come from anywhere. Ideas can come from anywhere. And all that we have to do 
is to look at our society and connect these technologies to their to the reality of today what i have been in a position to do is because of my students and people around me some of them have translated technologies to products and uh, we have these kinds of things in the field but to, to take such technologies forward to people we have built a new center so this is called the international center for clean water as you can see it's a beautiful place anyone can come to this place with an idea and build a technology and take that technology with them uh, to the field and i would like you to look at the website of this particular uh, place that website of this particular place is iccwindia.org iccwindia.org so that is the website uh, it is you should be able to see that uh, iccwindia.org and if i have time uh, for another four more minutes do i have time Yes sir you can speak okay. sir All right so i don't know whether you are seeing the screen right now but uh, uh, you are seeing what screen i am planning to type this particular i c c w let me just type this here and uh, i c c w india.org so let me go to the screen let me go to the screen here and uh, i am stopping that share and i am going to show you this particular screen this is the iccw are you able to see the screen yes sir yeah we can iccw india there is a video here i'm going to just play this 4 minutes video for you are you able to see yes sir we are able to we can see yes sir
So that was uh, what I wanted to show you. And let me just take the last slide and then uh, stop uh, here. Um, this is what I wanted to show you. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure talking to you. I realized that I did not touch upon air, but there are several activities happening in the group to understand dust and how to remove them. And if you look at my webpage, you will see several papers. And if you are interested in specific technologies, I can point uh, to some of those papers. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Kalpanasi. Thank you very much, sir. It was, uh, what I can say, it was just a mesmerizing experience, sir. Uh, I was thinking that you should not stop and it must go on and go on and go on. It was such a rare, it was such a rare experience uh, to be here with you. Uh, with your permission, sir, can we take one or two questions? Certainly, certainly. Whatever uh, number of questions, yeah. Uh, participants, we can take one or two questions uh, looking yes. at the time. If, if you have some questions, please raise your hands. Or uh, if you uh, you can also drop at uh, the mailbox, which is uh, Government Mother Science Pedagogy 10, uh, which is being given to you. So we may forward those questions to Dr. Uh, T. Pradeep. It is in the chat as well. I think some people would, must have typed something in chat. Okay, yes. You might want to look at that. Somebody, Deepak Tiwari has entered and waiting room, etc. Okay. Uh, administrator, will you please uh, tell me that if there are any genuine questions? You may just tell me. No, ma'am, till now we don't have any questions. I request all the participants to, if you have any question, you can just raise your hands and then we will allow you to ask your question to, uh, to our resource person directly. If somebody raises hands, please do let us know within one or two minutes. Ishwar Lal raised hand. Okay. Uh, Ishwar, do you have any question? Ishwar, Pashnam Pushna Chate Hekya, Apo unmute Karde. Administrator, please unmute Ishwar if he wants. He's a student. If he wants uh, to ask some questions. He has uh, muted him back. Okay. Ishwar, just uh, uh, accept that uh, there will be a box in front of open, will be open in front of your dialog box. Just click over there. Then you will be unmuted. What I can tell you for uh, all of you, one important message that, you know, that's relevant is that it has been possible for me to take some technologies to people just because of my students. Yes, sir. And uh, this has been possible because of their parents. An IIT Madras student uh, at the end of uh, the BTEC or MTech or PhD or something, there is some job out waiting for them, but uh, the parents sacrifice them. And, uh, and that sac sacrifice has been the reason for all this success. And for you, those of you who wish to get into uh, industry, building a technology, you must realize that it takes about six to eight years of intense struggle. And that struggle, there is no substitute for that. Actually, that, as that... your teachers, as your teachers might have told you, Saraswati rewards only slowly. That is the most important thing. I think I think that that is a takeaway lesson from you, sir, too. Because uh, definitely, students being the most important stakeholders, if they understand anything, then that is the real success of. Uh, I, I I can say that is a real success story. So thank you very much, sir. Now I'll invite, uh, I'll mail you questions. I yeah. would like to invite uh, head of the department chemistry, Dr. Brajesh Pare, to please come forward for extending the formal vote of thanks. Dr. Pare, please. Ma'am, we have a raised hand from uh, Priyanka Srivastava. Could we take uh, her question? Priyanka, Priyanka, you want to ask a question? Please they are all in waiting room, maybe. They may have to be permitted into the room. 
no, no, sir. Uh, they are the person who are in waiting room are joining the session now. So okay, good, good. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Priyanka, uh, do you want to ask question? Unmute her so that she can ask. Yeah, Priyanka, please ask your question. Priyanka Shrivastav ji, do you have any question? If you have any question, you are already unmuted. Please ask your question. Priyanka ji, am I audible to you? Okay, then Dr. Pare should come forward and uh, extend vote of thanks. I'll just mail the question to uh, the eminent speaker and he will just answer through the mail. Uh, Dr. Pare, please come forward. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for unmuting me. Uh, what a uh, mesmerizing talk it was, Professor Pradeep. And uh, uh, really, I mean, uh, uh, Saraswati rewards slowly, you know, that's a really wonderful thing. And on behalf of the Mother Science College, I really, I express uh, gratitude and uh, so sparing, uh, you know, the valuable time, knowledge and energy for all of our students. And sir, to have a professor and a researcher uh, like you, Oh, who is highly decorated academically is a great privilege for all of us. Uh, Professor Pradeep, uh, amid this global uh, pandemic, uh, what could be better to have a talk such as this? You know, a real concern for the, the clean planet. Uh, you showcase the uh, various aspects of research taking place around, and of course, you know your own contribution in the field. Uh, you discuss various excellent examples, really, and about the sustainability of various elements uh, from the periodic table and. Uh, and the example of the seashell, you know, like is wonderful, you know, that uh, at room temperature and uh, water as a solvent, you know, um, many things can happen. Sir, keep blessing us. We sincerely seek your blessings, uh, Professor Pradeep. And uh, really, you know, it, uh, when you stop, you know, it was really, we were uh, surprised. Uh, I'm thankful to Dr. Kalpana Singh also for constantly uh, pursuing Professor Pradeep to, to get him, you know, for, for this talk. So thank you very much to all the listeners also. And uh, Professor Pradeep, please uh, keep uh, guiding us for, for the rest of the time also, and for our college and for our students. Thank you very much. Thank you to one and all. Thank you very much. OK. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Pradeep, I want to just request you. We have uh, one. Uh, uh, I have a request. We have with us Dr. Uma Sharma, professor of chemistry, School of Studies in Chemistry, Vikram University, Ujjain. She wants to ask something. Professor Sharma, uh, administrator, please unmute Professor Sharma. Uma Sharma, madam. Yes. Yeah, she's unmuted. Madam, you can go ahead. Yes. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Namaskar. Good afternoon. I would like to ask, uh, as you have mentioned about biofilms, so can we use dendrimer uh, for that purpose? Dendrimers, yes, because, yeah. The, so, there what are, are the several... other characteristics should be checked? Number of biomaterials can be used. What I said was that uh, if a nano structured material, if we yeah. can use a, some kind of a template, if that template is uh, bio derived, obviously okay. that template is by and large friendly, eco friendly, okay. and that is also available cost effectively. Okay. Now, water is a very price sensitive market. Yes. Anything you may be able to make a fan, you know fantastic material of uh, some kind, but it will never hit the market. Okay, thank you. And it is important to realize that water, if it is served at let us say one paisa, two paisa per liter, yeah. that is the best technology that you can do. Okay. So when we asked uh, ourselves, yes, people asked us, you know, what kind of nanotech are you doing? I said mm -hmm. affordable nanotech. Affordable. So what is affordable? Okay. So I kept that price tag of this affordability as five paisa per liter about 10 years ago. Uh, today we have gone to two paisa per liter. Okay. So without I, that, yeah. any material dendrimers are fantastic. There are many dendrimeric molecules yes. uh, which may be used as templates. Yeah. But you have to keep this affordability and sustainability in mind. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Thank the you. vote has been expand, extended. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, participants, for being with us on this platform. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Namaskar. Thank you, Dr. Parin. Thank you, principal.
uh, now I would request all the participants uh, to please write their names in the chat box. We are activating chat box. Please write your names and your and your institute name too. Without institute, we cannot certify you. Please write your institute name too. You can just type your name, you can just type your institute name and you can just leave the uh, session. After writing this, leave the session. We are not asking for any feedbacks as this lecture was of the caliber where intellect where no feedback is required. So we will certify depending on your attendance. So please write your names, write your institute name and then you can be, we'll be certifying according to that. Ma'am, should we wait for a while? Uh, 
uh, we should wait uh, for some time because we are writing their names too. There are 97 participants left. Uh, okay. I request participants to please speed up the process. Write your names. I have put up a banner for 10th of September. We are going to have this personality development workshop on 10th of September. Please do join this also. Participants can write their names, their institute name, and they can leave the session as we, we would be able to know that how many are left. We are here for five more minutes. Students, please write your names and leave the session. Please write your names. Please write your names within uh, three to four minutes. Otherwise, we will be closing this session and then your attendance will not be recorded. Administrator, you can close this meeting after two minutes.
Please close the uh, Mr. Raikwar. Are you listening? 